Welcome back, everyone. We're now getting ready for our next talk. Up next, I would like to introduce German Daily, who will be talking about how to fail with serverless. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for joining, and I'll let you take it from here. So my name is Jeremy Daly, and uh, today we're going to talk about how to fail with serverless. Um, so a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm the CTO at a small company out of um, New York called AlertMe. Um, I do some consulting with companies that are building in the cloud. I've been doing that for a very, very long time. So uh, the gray in my beard, I decided to stop covering it up. I also have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old daughter, so that helps contribute to that as well. Um, I started working with AWS very early on, uh, way back in 2009, uh, using EC2 and ELBs and all that fun stuff, and then started using Lambda Functions once it became GA in early 2015. Um, I also blog at jeremydaily.com. I do a lot of open source projects, do a, quite a bit of speaking as well. Um, every week on Tuesdays, I publish a newsletter that is all about serverless that captures all kinds of, uh, all kinds of stories and, and things that are happening in the serverless space. Uh, and then I host a podcast uh, called Serverless Chats, which is every Monday morning, and you can find that at serverlesschats.com. I'm also an AWS Serverless Hero, which is a great program that AWS has that lets us sort of comment on things that the um, uh, you know that they're working on and, and help us you know contribute, and they support us in our efforts to uh, you know continue to build things with Serverless and and educate the uh, educate the community. Um, so I have a QA dash Jeremy dash daily uh, Slack um, group that if you want to ask me questions, go there. I will spend some time after the talk there. So please feel free to uh, ask me some questions. All right. So today uh, the agenda is kind of busy. I got a lot of slides here, um, but I want to try to get through as much information as I can. Um, so first we'll talk about distributed systems and serverless. We will talk about writing code for the cloud and what's different about doing that versus writing for traditional applications. Um, we will get into failure modes in the cloud, and we will finally finish with a couple of serverless patterns uh, that you can use to deal with failure in the cloud. Uh, so distributed systems, we're all at a you know, failover conference, so hopefully we're familiar with these. Um, but essentially, distributed systems are just a bunch of different networked computers that need to pass messages back and forth uh, between one another in order for the system to achieve some goal. The other thing that's important about distributed systems is that they are really, really hard. And so anyone who has built a distributed system, if they tell you it's easy, they are definitely missing something there. Um, so if you're familiar with this man, Warner Vogels, he's a CTO at Amazon.com. You've probably heard this several times today, but he has a famous saying that everything fails all the time. Um, and this is particularly true with distributed systems. So serverless applications are essentially just distributed systems on steroids, right? So they're smaller. They use more distributed compute units. So you're not using bigger stacks, more monolithic um, mo monolithic sort of uh, uh systems so that, that they're very, very small compute units. Um, they are stateless, so they require network access in order to rehydrate themselves uh, if you need to get data or, or some sort of configuration into them. Um, they're very uncoordinated, right? So there's you need to use things like buses or queues or pub sub or state machines in order to make sure that these systems or these different compute units can communicate with one another. And finally, they're heavily reliant on other networked cloud services. All right, so what does it mean to be serverless? I'm not sure how many people are familiar exactly what serverless is, um, but just some of the high level overview or high level points is the fact that there's no server management, right? AWS or Google or Azure handles the server management for you. They're very flexible when it comes to scaling. You only pay for when it executes or you pay for value. Sometimes you do run things um, for a little bit longer and you, you do need to pay for those all the time. Uh, and there is this built-in automated high availability, right? If, you, you, if one server goes down, AWS or whoever will take care of routing it to a different server for you uh, or a different function for you. But some things you don't necessarily know about serverless is that it requires a lot of configuration um, and a deep knowledge of different cloud services in order to make all these things work because we're using Lambda functions usually or functions as a service. So we're not installing our own software there. We have to use software that is available through other services. It's also highly event driven. So uh, pretty much everything that happens is going to be invoked by some sort of event. All right, so there are a lot of services uh, in AWS, for example, this is the AWS ecosystem that need to communicate with one another. Um, so everything from Lambda functions to SQS to EventBridge and IoT and AppSync, 
Um, these are all the sort of serverless components. Then there's a number of managed uh, services out there like Amazon um, Elasticsearch or Elasticash or Fargate and some of these other ones. Um, and then finally, you might have some systems that are running on EC2. So if you're running Docker containers or you're running a SQL Server or MongoDB or you're running something like Kubernetes, these things are not serverless, uh, at least in the AWS ecosystem, but we still need to make sure that we can communicate between all these different services. So traditionally, as DevOps people or as systems people or ops people, we would we would think about things in terms of reliability and high availability, right? We want to keep things um, we want to keep things running as much as we possibly can. So this is about maintaining some level of operational performance, but really about the uptime here, right? So how many nines can we can we get in? So with serverless applications or distributed applications in the serverless context, a lot of that uptime and reliability is handled for you. So we can start shifting and thinking more about resiliency. And essentially what resiliency is, and you're probably familiar with this, but it's the ability to absorb that impact, right? To, to be able to provide some sort of acceptable level of service even if a part of our application fails, right? So this is not about preventing failure. This is about being able to deal with it or gracefully deal with it. Um, all right, so let's talk about writing code for the cloud. So typically in our normal application, we'd write some code, we would package it somehow, we'd compile it, we'd upload it to a server or part of our CI CD process. Um, but when we're writing code for serverless applications, most of our business logic is gonna end up inside of a Lambda function. Now, if you're familiar with Lambda functions or you're not familiar with Lambda functions, um, they're an ephemeral compute service, okay? So they, they execute one small piece of code and then they go away. All right, and this only runs in response to your event. So you have to generate or simulate an event that tells that Lambda function to actually process or run that piece of business logic for you. It's not just sitting there waiting for things to happen. It also automatically manages the runtime for you, the compute and the scaling, which is really great um, under most circumstances, but it also takes away a little bit of your control. So you've got to be comfortable with that. Um, it uses a single concurrency model. So this is great, meaning it's a single threaded for every single concurrent execution, but that also means that you can't share things in the same thread. So just something to think about there and also has a, uh, an effect on downstream systems, right? If you have a, a downstream system that can't quite scale as well, um, the single concurrency model can cause some problems with that. And the other thing is that there's no sticky sessions or guaranteed lifespan. So we can't guarantee that somebody who accessed Lambda function A is going to access the same Lambda function after that. Also, the Lambda function could run for one minute. It could run for 20 minutes. We, we don't have control over that. So we have to think about, um, we have to think about that. So the way that we would traditionally handle errors is that we would write some very fancy try catch logic, right? So we try to do something important. If it failed, then we would maybe write to our, uh, you know, write to our logging system. Maybe we retry the operation, something like that. Um, but the problem is that what happens to that original event, right? So if somebody sends an event in and everything's event driven and serverless, if that event comes in and then there's an error and we try to catch it, if we don't capture that event in our retry logic here in our cat or in our catch logic, then we would lose that event. But here's the problem. What happens if there's a network issue and you can't write to your logging service, right? These are ephemeral. We need to use we need to use network connections in order to even connect to our logging service, even though it's built in and it's possible to lose events that way. So if that doesn't get written, what happens? What happens if the function container crashes? This doesn't happen very often, but it does. That means that our, our logic for catch doesn't even get a chance to run, right? So that event is lost. And what happens if the function itself never runs? So let's say that we send an event in, it gets captured by the service, but then something happens in that service, never triggers the Lambda function, um, then it never runs and we don't even get a chance to you know, do our retry logic. Um, so obviously quite, you know, quite important is losing events is a very, very, very bad thing. Um, all right, so in order for us to think about the types of errors that exist now, we're not limited to just our simple something failed, right? Lambda functions are a service that's provided by AWS and they have a bunch of different uh, error types that go beyond just your simple unhandled exceptions. So we get these, right? We get something happens, whatever couldn't connect or there was a, a some sort of issue, we get those. But we also get errors like function timeouts. If your function times out before it can complete executing, complete the execution, um, then your error handling code never runs and that event is lost. Um, if you get an out of memory error, meaning that it uses too much memory and the Lambda function dies, then that code for catching it never runs, you lose the event. And finally, there's these things called throttling errors where you can only have so many concurrent functions running at once. 
Some of this is controllable, um, but what happens is if you don't have a way to handle that throttling, then that event also gets lost. All right, so this is an important point to remember when we're building applications for the cloud that we need to remember that the cloud is better than you at things like error handling, right? At things like retrying failures, at understanding network failures, at understanding its own network topology so that it can be smart about handling failover and redundancy. So if the cloud is better at doing all these things than you are and better than the code or the custom code that you might write to do that, then why not just let the cloud do those things for you? Uh, and, the, and the way that we do this is what I call failing up the stack. And essentially what we wanna do is we don't want to swallow errors with try catches in our Lambda functions. Instead, we want to just fail that function. Now, there's a caveat to that. You know, sometimes we we want to do this. Most of the time we do, but there are a few exceptions. Um, but essentially, we return the errors directly back to the invoking service. Because again, we have all these different services communicating with one another. When, when something fails, it tries to invoke a Lambda function that fails. We want to make sure that service knows that it fails, failed so that we can we can properly handle that. Uh, and the way that we would do that is by configuring a number of these built-in retry mechanisms that will allow us to reprocess the events. And if we can't reprocess the events, then we can use something called dead letter queues and we can actually capture, uh, we can capture those different failed events. All right, so there are three types of Lambda functions. This is, these are, these are my sort of uh, beliefs that there are three types of, uh, of, of Lambda functions, um, but I consider there to be the Lambda lift uh, which essentially, you know, we'll talk about all three of these separately. Um, but this is sort of a, um, you know, a common approach to building Lambda functions, but a little bit scary. Um, there's this idea of the fat Lambda, which is uh, sort of a mini Lambda lift that we'll talk about a little bit more. And then finally, the single purpose function, which is something that we really, really want to try to strive for. So if we look at the mighty Lambda lift first, this is the 2001 Space Odyssey. This is the updated version of it, the AWS version of the monolith. Um, and essentially what this does is the entire application runs inside a single Lambda function, right? And this is often that lift and shift. So we take our Flask app or our ExpressJS app and we just put it into a Lambda function because essentially a Lambda function is just a mini uh, Linux server, right? So it will allow us to do these sort of things. Um, most of the time, any type of event that triggers this is going to be a synchronous event. So it's going to be either through API gateway or an application load balancer. And the important thing here is to note that any partial failure is typically handled in the code. So if there is a connection to the database and that fails, then there's probably some retry logic in there, or there's some other, uh, there's some other retry logic or some other uh, code or, or logging logic that's built in there. So that's uh, a little bit dangerous. We'll get into that uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, so then there's the fat Lambda, right? So this essentially is what you're doing is taking several related methods and you co-locate them into a single Lambda function. Um, and this is used oftentimes to optimize like what would be a synchronous operation. So maybe it's an API call. It's like the checkout process and it has to connect with three or four things that have to happen synchronously before you can reply back to the client. If something like that happens, um, then this is a pattern that you can use. There are actually several people that use this. Lego is using this. Uh, Bustle uses a pattern like this. Um, but the problem is that, again, partial failures are still handled in the code. So this is something to be sort of wary of. But under the right circumstances, this can actually be really useful. Like I said, for Lego and, and Bustle, they, they use this quite successfully. Um, so then finally, we have the single purpose function. And this is something that we should really strive for if it's possible for us to do this. And that's because each one of these functions will execute a single discrete piece of business logic. Um, and why this is important is because that single piece of logic can be reused. It can be invoked synchronously. It can be invoked asynchronously. Um, and then if it fails, it's generally a total failure, which means that when that function fails, you can pass back whatever that failure was to the invoking service and let that deal with it, you know, let the cloud deal with it for you. And what's great is that these can be reused in step functions or other types of workflows. And you can also scale or even throttle these independently. And then you can utilize the principle of least principle, which is great because you can set tightly scoped IAM roles um, and, uh, and make sure that if you only need to write to a DynamoDB, that that function can only write to a DynamoDB. Um, and if there's ever any sort of, um, you know, any sort of intrusion into that or any sort of, uh, comp if it gets compromised, then it, they're very limited in terms of what they can do with it. All right, so we're going to get into this idea of failure modes in the cloud. So there is a, sorry, failure modes in the cloud. There is a lot of information here. It's sort of this fire hose of overly technical content. Um, I'm presenting it here. This is going to read a little bit like documentation, but I, I do this because 
I, I don't expect everybody to memorize all these things or to learn them, but just to understand that each one of these different ways in which um, you know failures can happen, there's different ways that the cloud has to handle them. Um, so just being aware of that and being able to go and look these up later, uh, I think is really, really helpful. Um, so the first thing we need to do is just understand retries, right? Super vital part of any distributed system. Network fails all the time. If we only tried once and it failed, then our system would, you know, barely ever work. So we need to make sure we retry if there's some sort of issue, um, you know, depending on what that particular issue is. So most of these cloud services will guarantee at least once delivery, um, which is really great because what it does is it means that you're always going to get that event delivered, even if it retries multiple times. The only problem with this is that, again, it's possible for that same event to be received more than once. And so if that happens, you need to be really, really conscious and make sure that all of your operations are item potent. Now, item potency just basically means that something can be repeated over and over again, and you always get that same result. So if you think about pure functions, for example, there are no side effects uh, to that. So some examples of item potent operations would be things like updating a database record, other than the modified date, sending the same request in over and over again should yield the same result. Um, authenticating a user, should be able to authenticate a user as many times as you want to with the same result. And then if you're checking, say, a record in the database, if it exists, um, you're not gonna create it. If it doesn't, then you do create it. So. There are a ton of different strategies to ensure item potency. I'm not going to go through all of them, but that's just something to be to be really conscious of. Um, so the other important concept here, which we mentioned a little bit earlier, was this idea of dead letter queues. So dead letter queues allow you to capture any event or message that fails to process or gets skipped. And sometimes messages get skipped on purpose uh, and for a reason. So we want to make sure that we capture both failed and skipped messages. Uh, what's great about this is then you can go and set alarms on it, you can inspect the data, and then depending on whether or not it was a soft failure or something like that, you could even replay that event from there if you wanted to do that. And in the AWS ecosystem, you can add these dead letter queues to uh, SQS queues, to SNS subscriptions, and to Lambda functions. All right, so Lambda invocation type. So I think when we typically think about invoking a function or something like that, we think about sort of our typical synchronous invocation. Um, there are actually four different ways that we can invoke a Lambda function. So the first one is synchronous. That's the request response. I make a request. It does some processing. I have an open connection. That data comes back to me. Um, but there's also the asynchronous request, right? And that's when we send an event in. It gets captured either by EventBridge or by uh, SQS or some other service that says, I've got the event and then it disconnects from the client and then the, the downstream processing will happen after the fact and we'll, we'll go through each of these in a little more detail. You have stream-based where you have some sort of stream or service that will push data into a Lambda function and the Lambda function will run that processing. And then you have polar-based. That's where you have a polling service that will attach to like an SQS queue, download messages and push those into a Lambda function as well. So synchronous Lambda functions have uh, different retry behavior than all these other services uh, or all these other different types of invocations. Um, and first of all, as we mentioned, they get invoked directly. It uses the request re, um, or the request response method and failures will be returned back to the invoking service. Um, so any retries would actually get delegated to that invoking application. Now, in some cases, there are some AWS services that will automatically retry synchronous invocations. So like an Alexa skill uh, or a Cognito authentication or something like that. Um, those will actually retry the synchronous uh, Lambda a couple of times. But for the most part, services don't retry. So things like API Gateway and Step Functions will not retry. You have to build that logic in yourself. And then finally, API Gateway and something like uh, Elastic or Application Load Balancer can actually get the errors and return them directly back to the client. So you can, you can just pass those errors right back through to the client because typically that's where you would want to handle those retries. So asynchronous Lambda retry behavior, there is actually something called the Lambda service that will accept any asynchronous request or asynchronous invocation. And that actually captures that message for you or that event, and it puts it into a queue that is managed by AWS. Um, the evoking service will get a 202 status code and just disconnect. So essentially it says, hey, I've got your message, great, and then you can go on about your day, and now it's sitting in this queue. And then what, 
will happen is the Lambda service will try to call your uh, try to call your Lambda function up to two times, and you can actually configure that using the max retry attempts. And then if the Lambda function is throttled, which we talked a little bit about throttling, then the message actually gets stored for up to six hours, which you can configure with this maximum event age in seconds. But if for some reason it can't get processed after six hours, then that message will be um, sent to a DLQ or to a on failure destination. So any fail or expired events get sent to that DLQ and we'll talk about failure destinations in a little bit. <clears throat> All right, so stream-based Lambda retries. So again, this is when you have records that are pushed synchronously to a Lambda function. So it's a separate service that invokes that Lambda function for you. Kinesis will send batches of up to 10,000. DynamoDB sends batches up to 1,000. Uh, and essentially what will happen is each one of those batches will be retried over and over and over and over again, up to 10,000 times if there is a bad message in there or if that, that batch fails for some reason. So it does retry the entire batch you can control that with maximum retry attempts, which you definitely should because you do not want it to retry uh, up to 10,000 times. It's a lot of wasted invocations. Um, if the messages do stay in that stream for more than uh, the maximum record age in seconds, then they will automatically expire and those, will be, uh, those records will be skipped. They can be stored for up to seven days. Um, and then there's this cool function that they added last year called bisect batch on function error. So if you have a poison pill, uh, you know, a bad message somewhere in there, let's say you send in a, a batch of 100 and that fails, it'll split it into 50 and 50 and then try both of those batches. And if one of those fails, it'll split that in 25 and 25 and so forth. Um, it's a very cool feature, uh, allows you to um, allows you to get to that single bad message and then push that into the uh, the failure queue, um, which is what you can do here with the on failure destination um, that you set as either an SQS uh, queue or an SNS topic and skipped records or failed records will be sent to, to that destination. Um, so finally, there's polar based Lambda retry behavior. Um, so this is where we have another service called the Lambda Polar that connects synchronously to an SQSQ and invokes the Lambda function in batches up to 10. Um, there is no bisecting in this uh, case. So entire, or if there's a failure, then the entire batch fails. Um, and you can set this setting called the maximum receive count. We'll talk about the redrive policy in a minute, but this allows the message to return to the queue multiple times. Um, so it can keep, you know, sort of the retry, it's sort of like that maximum, uh, uh maximum attempt, um, from the, from the, the, uh, stream based. And, uh, if the poll, oh, sorry. So then the polling frequency itself is tied to function concurrency. So this is something that actually is a little bit tough to tweak, but it's well documented if you go and you look it up. But essentially, if you set your Lambda function to only process 50 concurrent requests, but then you flood your queue with you know 10,000 messages, um, rather than it spinning up 10,000 uh, 10,000 functions to handle it, it'll spike initially, but then it'll it'll match itself to the polling frequency or match itself to the concurrency, so that only a certain number of messages are pulled through, which is great for for doing throttling and, and re, re, relieving things like downstream pressure and stuff like that. Um, there's also this setting called visibility timeout. And this is one of those things where in order to get the polling to work right with the concurrency and so forth, you have to set it to at least six times the timeout. But this is stuff that if you are doing this, it's well documented and something you would want to look at. Um, all right, so Lambda destinations, this is another new feature that was added recently. This only works for asynchronous invocations. Again, DLQs only work for asynchronous invocations as well on a Lambda function. Um, but what you can do with this, which is really great, is you can route the success or the failure, and, actually, and the failure if you want to. So if you're using asynchronous Lambda functions to do some sort of background processing, then what you can do is if that succeeds, you can send that off somewhere else to one of the destinations that's supported um, and then do some future processing or do something after that without having to write that code in your Lambda function to do that. Um, and then if it fails, you have a, a number of choices where you can send that failure to as well. Um, so the on failure is new, but it really should be favored over standard dead letter queue. And the reason for this is that dead letter queues only capture the payload itself, whereas on failure destinations will capture the context. So you'll get things like um, you'll get things like the stack trace and the error message. So you'll know why a particular message failed. Um, destinations can actually be an SQSQ, an SNS topic, another Lambda function if you wanted it to be, or VentBridge, which is the serverless uh, enterprise bus um, that, uh, that AWS has. Uh, so a couple more things about this. So the, the destination specific, uh, or the destination is based on, or the JSON, I should say, is based on the destination that it's going to. So if you're using SQS or SNS as your uh, destination, it's going to get passed in as the message. 
If you're using Lambda, it gets passed in as the payload to the function itself. Uh, if you're using event bridge, it gets passed in as the detail and you get some other information such as, you know, whether it was a failure or a success as well as things like the function and destination are which is helpful um, if you're debugging and you want to look at some more information. Um, all right, so SQS redrive policy. So this is the thing where essentially what we can do is um, we can control uh, if a message fails multiple times or can't be processed, then it can get processed by the SQS queue uh, or by the redrive policy. So essentially the uh, DLQs for Lambda functions only work on asynchronous invocations. So it would not work on a, um, it would not work on an SQS queue. You have to set the redrive policy instead. Um, if it goes over the maximum receive value, then that's when it gets sent to it. Um, SNS has a similar policy where you can attach these to subscriptions. Um, you can only send them to SQS queues. You can't send them back to SNS. Um, client side errors like the Lambda doesn't exist, for example, it wouldn't retry things like that. And messages that go to SQS or Lambda actually retried 100,000 times. So that's kind of crazy. Um, but there's also SMT, uh, SMTP, SMS, mobile. Those are 50 times or six hours. I know this is confusing because they're all, they all seem to be different. And if you send it to an HTTP endpoint, then you can um, uh, set custom re, you know, retry policies and things like that. Uh, finally, event bridge. So this will retry for 24 hours with some back off. Failed events are lost, but it's very unlikely that's going to happen. And then once events are actually accepted by the target service, the failure modes of those services are used. So if you're using a Lambda function, for example, those, uh, for example, those get invoked asynchronously and all of those uh, controls would happen there. Um, so then Lambda functions, these are uh, state machines. And this is an example of like the Saga pattern, for example, using um, uh, this is an example by Yen Tre uh, that allows you to essentially invoke these functions synchronously. And if they succeed, great. But if they fail, then you can use retriers and catchers and do all kinds of complex error handling patterns. Um, you also get back an error name so you can do different conditions, like whether it's a timeout or so forth, you can react differently. Um, and then you have all kinds of control over the back off rate and the uh, interval seconds and things like that. Um, if you are writing code in your Lambda functions or something else that's accessing one of these services, um, there's all kinds of retries built into the AWS SDKs uh, and you can use those as well. All right, I'm running out of time. So quickly, we want to give you some error handling patterns. Um, so buffering and throttling events. So our, typically, we might invoke a Lambda function like this, and we would want to uh, write data to RDS. The problem is, is that that RDS could get overwhelmed. So we'd put something like an SQS queue in between. This can capture the events and then reply back to the client that we've captured it. We then would put a Lambda function that's throttled, set the concurrency here, and then we pull that SQS queue with a synchronous request. And if the, if the data is processed successfully, great. If it's not, then we can actually capture that with that redrive policy we talked about. So key points here is that that SQS queue has a ton of durability. Um, throttle lambdas will reduce that downstream pressure for you. And failed events are stored for further inspection and replay. So you get a lot of control. You don't lose those events, even if things are overwhelmed. Um, it is possible to get rid of the Lambda function here. You can use something called service integrations. Um, and then you could just write API gateway to SQS queue. And again, you're, you're writing less code um, and it's probably much more secure. Um, all right, so the circuit breaker pattern, this is a familiar pattern. This is how something we might, or this is how we might do it in uh, serverless. We'd have the same thing here, but let's say we want to write to a Stripe API. The happy path is great. Everything works perfectly. But as we said in the beginning, everything fails all the time. So if we put a status check and use some sort of a cache like DynamoDB or ElastiCache, then we can do a status check. If everything works, then great. We mark the circuit as closed and we re respond back to the client. Um, but if it fails, we want to increment some sort of a failure count. And if it eventually gets to a certain level, um, then what we want to do is uh, mark, mark it as failed or as closed, or sorry, as open. And then we can reply right back to the, to the client and say, sorry, this, this API isn't working right now. Uh, and that can be any trigger to trigger that Lambda function. But this allows us to be good sort of citizens and not overwhelm an API that's probably already stressed out. Um, so we want to check that every once in a while with a half open request. If that works, great. Uh, if it fails, no big deal. We just you know, mark it as, as, as uh, open again. Um, but if it succeeds, then we update our cache and we go ahead and say, okay, it's now closed and things will continue to work. So you wanna cache your cache with your warm functions just means don't call that DynamoDB all the time. Uh, use a reasonable failure count and understand item potency. So just quickly, a couple of key takeaways. Everything fails all the time, so just be prepared, prepared for that failure. Utilize the built-in mechanisms of the cloud, the retry mechanisms. They're much better than anything that you can write, probably. Uh, understand those failure modes so that you do not lose that data. 
and make sure you buffer and throttle events to distributed systems so that you don't overwhelm the downstream systems. Um, and then embrace asynchronous processes to decouple components. It's a very important point. Um, all right, so thank you very much. So these are a couple of things that I'm working on here. Um, my, my blog, my podcast, my newsletter, uh, a couple of open source projects I have. Follow me on Twitter. And um, if you uh, um, want to talk with me in the chat afterwards, go to the QA Jeremy Daily hashtag there. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for joining us today. And also very much thank you for making sure that we stay on track. Really appreciate that. No problem. Thank you so much for having me.